Football isn't just a game. It's America's modern day gladiator spectacle, a display of supreme athleticism, strategy, and sheer brutal will. As an ex-football player myself, that's a truth I know well. And it's something I kept thinking about while watching the new movie, Him. It could take anywhere from weeks to years for a brain to recover from a trauma like this. It's a film that forces you to confront the extreme lengths an athlete will go to to succeed and what they're willing to sacrifice for the game. As his doctor, I can't tell you what's safe for him to play football. And as a fan. And now, midway into a new football season, we're seeing that sacrifice play out every weekend. We've already watched star players go down with season-changing injuries right before our eyes. And it makes you wonder, what is the ultimate cost of that sacrifice? While we often see the immediate damage, the torn ligaments, the broken bones, what about the injuries that we can't see? What about the damage being done underneath the surface, to the very orchestrator of our body, the director of all action, the brain. It turns out that human skulls aren't designed to smash into each other. Today we're pulling back the curtain on a hidden world of injury within football, the world of traumatic brain injury. And within that world, there is a shadow, a condition that has become almost synonymous with the sport itself, CTE. It's a term we all hear, whispered in headlines and documentaries. But what is it? The truth is shrouded in complex science, heated controversy, and a single critical question. Long after the cheering stops and the state Stadium lights go dark. How far does the damage really go? A new study from Boston University shows young athletes might be at a greater risk of CTE than we may have thought. For returning viewers, thank you very much for your support. Do me a solid and give the video a like and leave a comment to appease the algorithm. If you are a new visitor, welcome to the channel where you leave smarter than when you arrived. Watch the video first and if you've learned anything, join our army of intelligent interns learning about health and science at the end. That said, let's get into it. To understand the insidious long-term danger of CTE, we have to start with how the brain gets injured on the field. We begin with the most obvious kind of damage, the acute injury. It starts with a traumatic brain injury, or TBI. Technically, any brain injury caused by an outside force. Think of a forceful bump or a jolt to the head, the kind of impact that happens on almost every play from a helmet to helmet collision. And you might be thinking, aren't players taught not to lead with their heads? Aren't there rules against that? The answer is, Yes, but that's the core of the problem. Despite rules and better techniques, these hits are still somewhat fundamental to the game. And it's not just helmet to helmet that can damage. It's a helmet hitting a thigh, a shoulder, the ground. The brain is getting jolted from all angles on countless plays. These impacts, both the massive highlight reel collisions and the hundreds of smaller unnoticed ones are in many ways unavoidable. And even though we are taught from a young age not to hit with our heads, there are some players who choose to disregard these rules in a search for the highlight reel hits that leave viewers stunned with amazement. The most common type of TBI in sports is a concussion. A concussion isn't a bruise that you can see on a scan. It's a functional disruption. The brain stretches and twists, causing chemical changes that lead to symptoms like headache, confusion, and dizziness. And they are incredibly common. While sports like MMA and rugby report some of the highest rates, American football is consistently a leader in concussions a pervasive issue at every level of the game. The NFL reported 149 concussions in the 2022 season alone, an 18% increase from the year before. That spike is partly due to a positive change, strength in protocols, and more conservative diagnoses after the scary public injuries to Miami Dolphins quarterback, to a tag of Iowa. And it's not good to get concussions. Better detection equals increased rates. But the baseline rate is what's truly telling. With approximately 61 concussions for every 100 games, the risk is simply baked into the structure of the season. And the problem isn't just at the professional level. Professional athletes know how to hit properly, but amateurs? Well, 
the risk is arguably greater where the players are most vulnerable. High school and college football players show some of the highest concussion rates in the sport. Younger players often have poor technique, more head first contact. They have weaker necks and less muscle control, which means less ability to absorb impact. Slower reaction times make it harder to brace for hits and inconsistent coaching or medical oversight only adds to the problem. When I was playing in college, I clearly recall two members of my team that would have weekly competitions to see who could get more marks on their helmets from the opposition's helmets. What would you say your favorite memory of, of your NFL career was? Do you remember that? I forgot everything that happened. Damn. <laughs> they me up, bro. I see team and I forgot everything. Many high school athletes also don't report symptoms, so they end up being re-injured with subsequent concussions before fully recovering from the original concussion. And that's especially concerning because their brains are still developing, making them more vulnerable to lasting damage. Not to mention that once a player has suffered one concussion, their odds of another increase dramatically. I've been hit immediately and I've seen stars like in the cartoons. I myself, unfortunately, have had my fair share of them. I've been hit where I see two of you. I have to try to put you two together, put you back together. And sure, that's dangerous during game time, but keep in mind, the risk follows you <laughs> off the field. An injured, vulnerable brain is more susceptible to damage from anything. A car accident, a fall, even a jarring physical activity. The injury accumulates, weakening the brain's defenses against the world. But while concussions make the headlines, a growing body of research suggests the real danger isn't the big hits you see, it's the thousands of smaller subclinical ones that you don't. Scientists don't yet have a magic number of hits that results in CTE. And although it's more commonly associated with football, it didn't start there. The roots go back a century, as Dr. Pyle Coley explains, to punch drunk syndrome. And we actually first recognized it in the 1920s when we noticed that boxers who kept getting hit in the head, whether they had concussions or not, were starting to develop some sort of changes in their thinking patterns, in their behavior, in their impulse control. That was the early understanding of what we now know as chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Hence, CTE. It's a degenerative brain disease caused by repetitive head trauma. And while a major concussion obviously causes damage, it's the thousands of subconcussive hits, the micro damage, that truly drive the disease. CTE is marked by a buildup of an abnormal form of a protein called tau, which slowly strangles and kills brain cells. Here's how it works. With every small hit, Tau, normally part of the neuron structural skeleton, gets sheared and misfolded. The brain's natural cleanup crew identifies this misfolded tau as waste and tries to clear it. But under a constant barrage of hits, the cleanup system gets overwhelmed. Instead of being disposed of, the misfolded tau starts to clump together, acting like a seed. That seed then spreads almost like a poison to neighboring healthy neurons, causing their tau to misfold and join the clump. These tangles literally choke the neurons from the inside, disrupting their ability to communicate and eventually killing them. So do I need a helmet? Basically, the damage keeps stacking up because the brain was never designed to have to repair itself this often. The symptoms of this damage are devastating. Memory loss, confusion, impulsive aggression, depression, and in advanced stages, dementia. Problems with cognition, problems with mood, problems with behavior. And the number one thing is changes your personality. And here is the most challenging part. A definitive diagnosis can only be made after death by examining the brain tissue. These are both NFL players, ex-NFL players. 60-year-old NFL player, and this is an 83-year-old player. Just looking at the surface of the brain, you can't be sure that there's any abnormality. We'll have to cut into it. Wow. His ventricle is very large. Yeah, it's notched. Even his hippocampus and amygdala look too small. First of all, it's really irregular. The corpus callosum is thin, but then this membrane should be that white, and it should be nice and 
straight and it's all gelatinous and irregular. It looks damaged. As Dr. Anne McKee, a leading neuropathologist, shows us, the brain's physical structure can be visibly ravaged. And while treatments and support can help manage the symptoms, unfortunately, there is no cure. Which means we have to focus our efforts on prevention trying to identify vulnerable populations and mitigating risks. We know that genetics plays a role because some people get hit in the head over and over and never get CTE. Beyond genetics, the risks come from the environment, in this case of contact sports. And it's a dangerous myth to think, I'm young, this is a retirement disease, I'll be fine for a while bro, let me push it. But. As we've seen with concussions, these brain changes can be found in shockingly young athletes. Normally we thought CTE really took a lifetime mm -hmm. to sort of manifest itself and it was repeated trauma to the brain. These were athletes under the age of 30 who wow. died and 40% and of them had CTE, wow. with a few of them actually having advanced stages of CTE. This makes raising awareness critical. However, Knowing what to look for is incredibly difficult. Since it can't be diagnosed in the living, especially in young people, the early warning signs are often written off as just teenage recklessness or moodiness. Unfortunately, by the time the symptoms manifest, because the early ones can be very nonspecific, mm -hmm. like you know, you're a little irritable, you're a little annoyed, like teenagers do that anyhow, <laughs> right? The goal here isn't to incite fear in a beloved sport that is a foundational part of many childhoods. The goal is understanding the facts. A landmark 2023 study founded by the NIH gave us the clearest picture yet. After analyzing 631 former football players' brains, they found a direct dose-response relationship. It wasn't about concussions, it was about cumulative exposure. Every additional year of play increased the odds of developing CTE by 15%. And when they measured head impacts directly, they found that every 1,000 additional hits raised the risk by 21% and severe disease by 13%. The critical conclusion? CTE risk is driven by total head impact exposure, not by the number of diagnosed concussions. It's the repetitive, often invisible hits that add up over time. To put it more clearly, every brain has a lifetime maximal count of blows it can sustain before CTE becomes an inevitability. This is supported by the most famous research institution on the subject, the Boston University CTE Center. Their work has become a rallying cry for TBI and a source of major controversy. Their finding is staggering. Out of 376 former NFL players' brains, they studied, 345 had CTE. That's 91.7%, bro. For perspective, a general population study found a rate of less than 1%. So why is this number so much higher than the NIH research we just discussed? One key reason is that the NIH included football players from all levels, while BU's figures come exclusively from the NFL. NFL players represent the most extreme exposure group. They take far more hits per year with much higher forces, larger bodies, faster collisions, longer seasons, and decades of cumulative exposure. They are the very top of the risk pyramid. Still, a rate that high, nine in 10, is an almost unbelievable statistic. The primary criticism of the BU data is selection bias. The brains they studied are overwhelmingly donated by families who suspected something was wrong. It's not a random sample of all NFL players. The process is the family calls our brain bank numbers. They will arrange for a local person to go out to the funeral home and uh, have the brain and, and the spinal cord removed. This creates a chicken or the egg dilemma. How do we know those symptoms were caused by CTE and not some other factor. It's a problem that is incredibly difficult for science to unravel, and the researchers themselves are the first to acknowledge this fundamental limitation. Now what we don't know is the, is the people that died, was there something else that made them more susceptible to CTE that also made them more susceptible potentially to dying? To their credit, the BU team doesn't just take the brain and diagnose it, they conduct an extensive investigative process with the families as well. We gather medical history, psychological history, substance abuse history. We gather a uh, history of their cognitive, behavioral, and mood symptoms, what kind of symptoms they had. And they basically, in a sense, paint a picture of what this patient had. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, and in a sense they come up with their own clinical diagnosis, and we try to come up with we show them our pathologic diagnosis, and hopefully the two correlate. It's their way of tackling an incredibly complex question: How do you isolate one potentially damaging factor in a life that is inherently multifactorial? This rigorous effort is what they hope will finally bring them closer to a definitive diagnosis during life. Another criticism that has even been made by those within the scientific and medical communities argues that BU's powerful media strategy, like releasing dramatic stats near the Super Bowl, can fuel fear over a more nuanced understanding. They emphasize that not every cognitive or behavioral problem in a former player is due to CTE, and that the link between CTE and suicide, while often highlighted in media reports, experts stress that a direct causal link is not yet scientifically proven. But it's important to recognize where this criticism finds its loudest megaphone. When you see headlines questioning the research, they often come from outlets like ESPN, whose business is intertwined with the sport itself. So when a sport as popular and profitable as football is under fire, we have to ask, is the pushback a genuine defense of player safety or a defense of a multi-billion dollar business? As Chris Nowinski, the founder of the Concussion Legacy Foundation emphasizes. There's a million reasons why you don't want to believe this is true. If you're a parent, no parent wants to believe that they put their kid at a risk that they didn't know. If you're an ex-player, you don't want to believe this because you don't want to believe you could be at risk and you don't want to believe you're going to watch some friends and suffer. If you're a fan, the best part of football used to be the big hits. And a lot of people tell me that we've ruined Sundays for them because they can't enjoy football in the same way. And we have to be honest about what we're asking people to reconsider. Football isn't just a game. It's about brotherhood. It's embedded into the American family dynamic. I get it. Football was a huge part of my life for many, many years. And as a father of sons who played contact sports, I understand that pull and completely understanding why people who've lost people battle with blaming the game. CTE is real, but it's real in everything. You can get it from any contact sport. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you had CTE. I mean, like I said, I'm sure I have it. You know, I have multiple concussions from playing football. I'm sure I don't know what the level of it, but football has um, opened a lot of doors for both me and my family and my brothers. And football is not the reason that Kevin developed a mental illness. So where does this leave us? Somewhere between undeniable risk and unresolved debate. Between the emerging science and a beloved tradition. Between health and entertainment. The gladiator's dilemma. On one hand, the evidence is clear. The repetitive violent collisions that are the foundation of football in inevitably lead to hits to the head, dramatically increasing the risk of debilitating incurable brain disease. Yet the controversy remains. We don't know the exact prevalence and fear can sometimes outpace the facts. That said, we can't afford to get lost in the spectacle. We now know the sacrifice isn't just a moment of pain on the field. It can be a lifetime of struggle off it, caused by the silent accumulation of thousands of small blows. The question we're left with the question every athlete from the professional to the aspiring has to ask themselves. It's the question at the heart of the film, him. How far will I go to succeed? After all this, the question is no longer simple. And for football itself, the future of the game now hinges on a different question. How far are we willing to go to protect players from the very nature of the sport they love? Thank you for joining me in this discussion about TBIs and CTE. Let's wrap it up with a roundtable analysis from you, the intern army. What are your thoughts about CTE in sports? Let me know in the comments. Be sure to join my intern army and click on your notifications if you want to catch my uploads every Monday morning. And if you dig what I do and you want to support our mission even more, consider becoming a member of my channel so that we can grow our creative team to serve you better. And don't forget to follow my gym, Hub 2.0 Fitness, for free right here on YouTube where we post content that helps you move better and prevent injury or its sister channel human at home where we show you how to be healthy in the space where you live otherwise as always that's been a word from dr. Chris Rayner not your everyday ortho where we see one do one teach one